It is with great pleasure that I get to introduce the first keynote speaker for today in the Kuhn 100 Conference at the University of Bucharest. Uh, Professor Hasok Chang is coming from Cambridge University. Uh, he is a, a lasting uh, friend and inspiring researcher. We're delighted to have him. Hasok, thank you for being here with us. And uh, his title um, is Kuhn and Science Education. Professor Chang, please take it away. Thank you so much, Andre, and everyone for inviting me. And thanks all, to all for being here. Um, the only regret, of course, is that we cannot be there physically in Bucharest, but it's nice to be back even digitally. So uh, thank you. And I, I apologize for having missed yesterday's um, sessions. I, I was just tied up completely with my normal business uh, in Cambridge. So glad that this is Saturday and I can be here. So uh, let me share my screen now. Is that working? Yes. Yeah. And I'll see if I can go into presentation mode. Yes. Yes. Excellent. So this is a, a new topic for me. It's science education in relation to Kuhn is something I have been thinking about for many years, but never actually managed to write anything to present or publish. And it's thanks to uh, Brad Ray who, who compels me to put in a chapter for a collection, yet another collection on Kuhn that he's editing. Uh, that I wrote this paper and, and it's the first time I'm actually presenting it anywhere. So um, please bear that in mind. So what I want to talk about is the subject of education, of course, in the context of normal science and the criticism that Kuhn received from many people uh, that normal science was dogmatic and particularly the education involved in normal science was so. And so what I want to do today is quickly review that criticism and then go back to Kuhn's own writings to see what he actually said. And I want to note that Kuhn was talking about really mostly the training of scientists rather than science education that everybody else gets in society. And I want to explore the idea that uh, those two things really should be separated. And then I'm going to say that doesn't really work. And I'm going to end by a proposal for making science education more pluralist. So that, that's the plan. And let me begin with this um, critique. So the training of scientists was a central part of Thomas Kuhn's view of the nature of science and Kuhn's views have been very influential, in fact, in the field of science education, as documented, for example, by Michael Matthews. Yet the nature of science education does not seem to command sufficient attention from philosophers and historians of science who engage with Kuhn's ideas. An anecdotal indication of this neglect is the fact that there is no index entry on education in the well-known monographs and edited collections on Kuhn by Honing and Hune, Horridge, Bird, Fuller, Nichols, Kindy and Arabaltis, uh, Richards and Daston, and the two collections by Ray in 2021. This is not to say that the authors involved do not discuss education at all in their books and papers, but it is a clear indication that education has not been a standard item of concern among philosophers who have engaged with Kuhn's views of science. And this is probably also the case among historians and sociologists of science who have used or criticized Kuhn's ideas, with notable exceptions such as Andrew Warwick. 
Even Kuhn himself did not expand greatly on the nature of science education in his later works, in which concerns about education seem to take a back seat as he focused on producing detailed historical accounts or refining and developing the philosophical ideas that he had proposed. This was not always so. Uh, even though the general fury surrounding Kuhn's views on science focused heavily on his views on revolutions and incommensability and the implied threat of relativism, in the early days, much of the critical concern was on normal science and the education of scientists was at the core of this concern. Um, critics focusing on normal science worried that Kuhn at least implicitly endorsed the dogmatic state of science education that he described. This was apparent in the famous 1965 conference in London, um, which gave rise to the collected volume, Criticism and the Growth of Knowledge, edited by Lakatos and Musgrave, which I'm sure everyone in this Zoom room is very familiar with. John Watkins, who was given the role of chief respondent to the opening paper that Kuhn gave at this conference, emphasized his objections to Kuhn's view of scientific community, I quote Watkins, as an essentially closed society, intermittently shaken by collective nervous breakdowns, followed by restored mental unison. Um, Watkins also gave a structured argument as to why he considered such a closed society would not be able to produce substantially new thoughts that would lead to the emergence of a new paradigm. In a more descriptive vein than Watkins, Paul Feyerabend opined that Kuhn had exaggerated the extent to which a paradigm typically achieves the kind of total dominance of a field and also the length of time for which any such dominance is maintained. In contrast to Watkins's and Feyerabend's view that science could not actually be as Kuhn describes it, Popper worried that something like Kuhnian normal science would actually become normalized. And it was in Popper's critique that the role of education was brought out explicitly. So I give you here on the slide the rant that Popper um, got into, where he says, normal science in Kuhn's sense exists. It is the activity of the non-revolutionary, the not to critical professional, of the science student who accepts the ruling dogma of the day. In my view, the normal scientist has been, uh, is a person one ought to be sorry for. The normal scientist has been taught badly. He has been taught in a dogmatic spirit. He is a victim of indoctrination. I admit that this kind of attitude exists. I can only say that I see a very great danger in it and in the possibility of it becoming normal. A danger to science and indeed to our civilization. And this shows why I regard Kuhn's emphasis on the existence of this kind of science as so important. So Kuhn was, I think, take, taken aback by the ferocity of this critique. He's suddenly the enemy of the people. And what did I say? Well, Kuhn did admit, right, that the picture of science and science education he was giving was rather dogmatic. And I'll say more about that. So in this talk, I want to address the two concerns expressed by Popper here and consider what can be done in science education in order to address them. So that's the danger to science and danger to civilization. And I think this discussion will have relevance to the place of all expert communities in democratic science, democratic society, that is not, not just natural science, but all kinds of um, expert communities which are demanding kind of authority in science, society. I keep saying science when I mean society. Okay. 
So before um, trying to develop my own ideas, let me review what Kuhn actually said about normal science and science education. It does seem obvious that the picture of normal science that Kuhn portrayed was a highly regimented and closed one. In his opening paper for the 1965 London Conference, Kuhn highlighted the dogmatism of normal science in conscious opposition to Popper's views. So this is what Kuhn says in that paper. It is normal science in which Sir Karl Popper's sort of testing does not occur rather than extraordinary science, which most nearly distinguishes science from other enterprises. If a demarcation criterion exists, it may lie just in that part of science which Sir Carl ignores. Then he says this bit I put on the slide. In a sense, to turn Sir Carl's view on his head, it is precisely the abandonment of critical discourse that marks the transition to a science. And this must have only served to amplify the worries of his critics arising from the reading, their reading of the first edition of Structure of Scientific Revolutions that had been published just three years earlier. So what was Kuhn's view on the role of science education specifically in the maintenance of normal science? I think it is fair enough to say that Kuhn regarded science education as a process of indoctrination, even though he did not use that word. Because at the heart of science as portrayed by Kuhn, there is a regimented process of training that equipped scientists for the rigorous and disciplined practice of normal science. And this is a talk, uh, the point that was already brought up in the previous presentation. This training process not only teaches the future scientists a set of specific beliefs and skills, but imparts an uncritical attitude. And Kuhn did make this view explicit um, in structure, though he did not give an extensive discourse on education in the book. Now, to my knowledge, the clearest statement Kuhn made about the nature of scientific uh, education and training was in his paper, The Essential Tension originally published in 1959 and reprinted in the 1977 collection of his papers, uh, whose title he took from this paper. Interestingly, uh, this 1959 paper was given uh, as a presentation at a conference called on the identification of scientific talent at the University of Utah. Here, he Kuhn began by cautioning against an overemphasis or, on divergent thinking in basic science. And he wondered whether flexibility and open-mindedness uh, have not been too exclusively emphasized by characteristics requisite for basic research by people trying to promote creativity in science and such things, which I, I think were the people organizing that conference. So in this paper, given three years before the publication of Structure, the concept of normal science is already clearly present. Normal research, he says, even the best of it, is a highly convergent activity based firmly upon a settled consensus acquired from science education and reinforced by subsequent life in the profession. Kuhn continues by noting that the single most striking feature of education in the natural sciences is that it is conducted entirely through textbooks. Again, the vade mecum aspect emphasized by the previous speaker. And Kuhn notes that this sets the natural sciences apart from other creative fields. How he describes the nature of this education is worth uh, looking at. Um, at some length, it comes in a few steps. So here, let, let me just read that um, longish quotation with you. Typically, undergraduate and graduate students of chemistry, physics, astronomy, geology, or biology acquire the substance of their fields from books written especially for students until they are very nearly ready to commence work on their own dissertations. 
they are neither asked to attempt trial research projects nor exposed to the immediate projects of research done by others, that is to the professional communications that scientists write for each other, journal articles in other words. This education is not learning by doing. I think it's important to recognize that. But it's learning through paradigms in the sense of exemplars, right? So science textbooks, he says, do not describe the sort of problems that the professional may be asked to solve and the variety of techniques available for their solution. Rather, these textbooks exhibit concrete problem solutions that the pro profession has come to accept as paradigms. Now, I think maybe today, 60 years, 70 years later, 60 years later, the situation may be shifting in science education somewhat because we have new movements for undergraduate research and things like that in vogue, but at least in the day when Kuhn was writing, I think it would have been a largely accurate description of how education was done. In a paper consciously inspired by Popper's critique of Kuhnian normal science, uh, Barry Van Berkel and colleagues uh, in an article in the journal Science and Education criticizes standard chemistry education in schools as normal science education which is even out of touch with chemical research. But in Kuhn's view, this disconnection from current research was a paradoxically essential feature of normal science education. Kuhn also emphasized the monism that he regarded as inherent in science education. And interestingly, he introduced that point in the 1959 paper through um, the exclusion of history. He says, there are no collections of readings in the natural sciences, nor are science students encouraged to read the historical classics of their fields, works in which they might discover other ways of regarding the problems discussed in their textbooks, and in which they would also meet problems, concepts, and standards of solution that their future professions have long since discarded and replaced. So the history of science, except for the mythical tales that bear little re resemblance to how actual developments unfolded, the real history of science is carefully kept out of textbooks, lest it should distract the students with alternative perspectives and problems. And that's exactly the kind of thing that I personally try to pick up from the history of science in the mode of work, which I call complementary science. Coming back to Kuhn, most of all the impression must be avoided in education that there are multiple competing legitimate approaches within a given scientific field. So what is, uh, when it is undeniable that there are multiple approaches, the textbooks present them as treatments of different subject matters. Uh, rather than exemplifying different approaches to a single problem field. This is consonant with Kuhn's later observation that science often develops by a process akin to biological speciation, through which fields split into subfields that do not share the same paradigm, as in the split, say, between physical chemistry and organic chemistry in the late 19th century, or even the split between the physics of atoms and the chemistry of atoms. So such a process of education is bound to produce a particular type of intellect. Kuhn admits that the education he describes is a dogmatic initiation in a pre-established tradition that the student is not equipped to evaluate. And he anticipated in that paper that, quote, even the most faintly liberal educational theory must view this pedagogic technique as an anathema. So when Popper declared that the normal scientist has been taught in a dogmatic spirit, etc., he was not telling Kuhn anything that Kuhn had not realized very clearly. And Kuhn said it himself in print at least six years before Popper's um, 
a condemnation was uttered. But Kuhn admitted the dogmatism of normal science education so freely only because he thought that somehow it did not retard scientific innovation. And that's a point I'm gonna to return to later on in this talk. But as I um, try to now enter into my own thoughts about scientific education in the light of what Kuhn has taught all of us, one thing to recognize at the outset is that for Kuhn, science education seems to have been just synonymous with the training of scientists. But we must recognize that in nearly all modern societies, a diverse array of people receive science education. In many, probably all the societies that we in this room come from, I think everyone who goes to any kind of school will receive some kind of science education. So in such societies, only a tiny proportion of students who are taught science at school go on to become professional scientists. And this is the case even for education at the university level. So science education is plainly not synonymous with the training of professional scientists. There are different purposes that science education can and should serve, and they need to be considered separately. I think it is understandable that Kuhn focused on the training of professional scientists, since his main concern as a historian and philosopher of science was to uh, consider how, uh, how, what made scientists how they were. He wasn't concerned so much about how non-scientists were. However, this silence on other aspects of science, science education is frustrating. The situation is also very ironic, given that Kuhn's initial work in the history of science was fostered in the context of the teaching of science through history in James B. Conant's program of general education at Harvard. Kuhn's relationship to Conant, his work in Conant's teaching program, and the social, socio-political context and derivers, derivers of Conant's work have all been extensively studied and debated by people like Steve Fuller, George Reich, and uh, Brad Ray. So I'm not going to say much about that. But the immediately pertinent point here is that Conan's program was expressly designed for students who are not destined to become professional scientists. In Conan's own words, graduates who are to be lawyers, writers, teachers, politicians, public servants, and businessmen. Conan's view concerning the teaching of science as part of gener general education was twofold. What we need to teach the public about science is not so much its specific content, but the nature of scientific knowledge and the process of scientific investigation. And secondly, the best way to impart this lesson is through the historical development of science. This was a view shared by various other pioneers of H HPS, such as George Sarton. Now, both aspects of Conan's view were quite contrary to Kuhn's view of normal science education. And this is ironic, again. Uh, Brad Ray, for example, has given a convincing argument about just how much of Conan's view of the nature of science Kuhn seems to have absorbed. So it's more strike, even more striking that on the subject of science education, Kuhn should have just rejected completely what Conan was concerned about. Of course, it could just be that Kuhn simply considered Conan's style general education of science to be an entirely different enterprise from the training of scientists. In that case, what we need to recognize is that it would be unwise, even illegitimate, to apply Kuhnian insights about the training of normal scientists to the question of what students who are not going to be scientists should learn about science and how they should learn it. 
The training of scientists rightly focuses on the teaching of the fundamental ways of thinking and methods of problem solving that are central to the current ruling paradigm in their intended subject. In contrast, science education for the non-scientist needs to go beyond the imparting of factual and theoretical knowledge and problem solving skills to pay attention to the nature of scientific knowledge and practice and to the cultural value and valency of science. These are points so well rehearsed in general debates about science education that I am not gonna presume to add anything new. However, I think the picture of the separation between different kinds of science education is not so simple because um, even among the university students who get degrees in the natural sciences, who clearly get the professional training, probably the majority do not become professional research scientists. Our field, history and philosophy of science is in fact full of these people who got undergraduate science education, who abandoned science and started doing these strange things. So the fact is that a large number of students who do not become scientists are still receiving the kind of education that's designed for science, those who will become scientists. And such an education often tends to generate a fear and dislike of science much more than it imparts any lasting kind of appreciation of the nature of science that Conant and others had hoped for. So there might be an argument, okay, for an educational reform designed to separate scientific and non-scientific students earlier on than we currently do, and giving each group an appropriate kind of science education. Or perhaps those on the professional science should also receive uh, the non-professional education because you would hope that they would be culturally educated in science as well as technically. But there are two difficulties that I see with, with such a separatist proposal. The first is what I call the problem of the Sagan undergraduates. In honor of the great um, American science writer and documentary maker uh, of the late 20th century, Carl Sagan. I confess myself to having been a Sagan undergraduate, by which I mean a young student of science who is inspired to enter into science by the kind of noble image of science that the likes of Sagan promoted. Science being an exhilarating enterprise of learning and research, both extremely useful for its practical applications and the deep sense of understanding that it generates. The scientific enterprise is also imbued with humanist values of progress, objectivity, curiosity, open-mindedness, and critical thinking. Now, it's a common phenomenon that the Sagan undergraduates become very discouraged and disillusioned by the reality of normal science education that confronts them by the time they reach upper level undergraduate training. The intellectual values that drew them into science are not nurtured in Kuhnian type scientific training. So unless they also happen to be very good at normal scientific puzzle solving and relish it as their daily life, they're likely to just leave science. The problem here is that there is a mismatch between what should motivate people to want to learn science and what enables them to succeed at normal science. Now, from a ruthless kind of social engineering perspective, one could consider Sagan undergraduates as misfits that we should not try to produce. We could fix the mismatch between motivation and ability by determining who goes into science strictly by normal scientific criteria. That is, we could turn early science education into a kind of a baby version of Kuhnian science training and only allow those who perform well in it to go into science at higher levels. 
some people say that in the Soviet Union, this kind of early separation was done, but I, I don't know if that's really true. Perhaps those of you um, from the former Eastern Bloc can tell me whether there's any truth in that. Anyway, in that kind of method, those who are inspired by the ideals of science, but not very good at normal science, will not be tempted to go into science professionally. Instead, they can be given access to general science education and learn something of cultural value about science. But now the second difficulty with the separatist proposal raises its head. Will a scientific community consisting only of those who do well in normal science education be actually the most effective one? In other words, the separatist proposal only makes sense if normal science education, as Kuhn described it, is indeed the best way to train scientists. And that was precisely the assumption that some of Kuhn's critics were questioning, as mentioned already. So now we um, return to the question concerning the training of scientists for their narrowly conceived scientific work. And here we come back to the question of innovation which Popper and Watkins raised strongly. Namely, how would such dogmatically educated people be capable of coming up with truly new ideas? Uh, Andre, how much more time should I spend talking? Well, we have a solid uh, 20 minutes before us. Uh, if you'd like to leave some time for the Q&A, uh, Okay, so I, I'll try to wrap up within the next few minutes. Yeah. So this is the final part of my talk. Um, basically, Kuhn's defense was that normal science is very effective in generating scientific revolutions. And here are some striking statements from him. Right? He says, the various uh, no, this is the most important point. Research under a paradigm must be a particularly effective way of inducing paradigm change. And in the 1950s, so that's from structure. In the 1959 paper, he says, this technique of explosive exposure to a rigid tradition has been immensely productive of the most consequential sort of innovations. So what he's saying is that there's historical evidence, right? That normal science is really good at destroying itself. So don't worry, Karl Popper, don't worry, John Watkins, Feyerabend, it will all result in great innovations. But how does it work? He says, uh, once an anomaly is identified within normal science and not readily resolved by the standard resources and techniques familiar in the ruling paradigm, Kuhn says that the normal scientists will start thinking creatively, basically out of desperation, because people who hit dead ends are forced to think laterally. So we now enter into the realm of extraordinary science where scientists even start behaving like philosophers. But I think what Kuhn has done uh, is he's taken us into an important problem without prov providing a convincing solution. So we can accept that innovation must be possible because it does happen. But figuring out how it happens is another whole issue. We can also fairly ask if Kuhnian normal science really is the best way to promote the kinds of innovation that are desired in science. I think Kuhn has demonstrated well enough that the pursuit of normal science has been quite an effective way of generating innovation. What he has not shown is that it's more effective than all other alternatives. And uh, there's a curious story about Joseph Schwab, which I'll come to if people are curious about that um, in the question period. So I would like to propose that even the professional training of scientists can be done in a less dogmatic way without causing them to lose the kind of focus that research within a paradigm provides. In short, the answer is pluralism. Um, which is, means to train scientists 
the future scientist, yes, in this rigorous kind of normal scientific tradition, but we're not restricted to training them in only one tradition. We can show them multiple different ways of um, doing things even within a given field. And on this point, I think Kuhn had an unduly pessimistic view of human psychology because he maintained that only people assured of the correctness of their paradigm would be able to tackle difficult esoteric puzzles. My view is that science students should be capable of learning multiple systems at an introductory level, even if they can only be trained to an advanced level in one system, simply due to the lack of time and mental energy. Training can properly include exposure to multiple ways of knowing, and such pluralistic exposure can, carry, can be carried up to a fairly high level. Now, when I just say that in the abstract, you may say this just sounds like unicorns, like a pipe dream, but it is in fact something that happens routinely in the typical education of scientists. And paradoxically, it's the field of physics which had formed Kuhn's thinking so strongly that most clearly exhibits the plurality of education. Any well-trained physicist today will learn at least three different formulations of classical mechanics. They will also learn special and general relativity. They will learn classical thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, wave and matrix versions of quantum mechanics, and some more advanced version of quantum theory, probably including quantum electrodynamics and the rudiments of quantum field theory. Physics students have to learn all these different things, and these are very different ways of looking at the physical world, and they provide very different modes of problem solving. All physicists going through basic training up to graduate school will learn all of these modes of thinking, not just some of them. That is, that is to say, uh, narrow and restricted as the mainstream education of physicists may appear, it actually embodies a great deal more plurality and diversity than meets the eye. And I believe that a look into the state of education in other sciences would also reveal the same kind of pattern. So I think um, this observation helps to answer the descriptive puzzle concerning how normal scientists can be actually so innovative because they in fact receive a fairly pluralist uh, education. And I think the students could be encouraged first of all, to notice and wrestle with the interesting differences and yes, incommensurability between all these ways of thinking that they learn. Rather than I'm uh, just trying to sweep the differences under the rug. The second part of the proposal I make is a bit more challenging, but certainly not impossible. It is to extend the pluralism beyond the boundary of what is currently considered standard. All the things I mentioned so far are absolutely standard. No physicist would want to keep any of that out. But what if we go a bit further? How would science education be if it consciously introduced students to certain cogent viewpoints that are currently dismissed by the majority of mainstream scientists without convincing reasons? For example, Lena Soler imagines a physics education that would teach students Bohmian mechanics, as well as the standard quantum mechanics formulated by von Neumann and Dirac. What would such education, rigorous on the side of each theory, do for the imaginative capacities of the well-trained physicist? I think that's definitely worth thinking about. And then going one step further, the most daring layer of pluralist education would be to reach into frameworks of thought that in some ways contradict what is taken as accepted knowledge or orthodox beliefs in current science. This would open the students' minds in a maximal way, but the risk is that of opening the door to truly unsubstantiated ways of thinking. This is where careful historical work can be helpful in just the way that Kuhn noted. A careful look at the history of science 
reveals that even the thinking of those who are recognized as great past scientists usually had elements that are incompatible with our current thinking. Going a little bit further, one can identify past systems of thought that are now considered quite wrong, but were respected for time and for good reasons. And I just briefly mentioned two examples here. The optics of Goethe um, really is a fascinating area. There are various scholars today who have revived it, both theoretically and experimentally. Um, and one shining example of this is the professor of philosophy at the Humboldt University in Berlin, Olaf Müller, um, who really began collaborating with an orthodox physicist to reproduce Goethean optics and it's wonderfully stimulating stuff. Another example is Greg Raddick and Annie Jamieson at, the, at Leeds University in England. Uh, Raddick picked up from history the work of Francis Weldon, who went in his experimental genetics, went very strongly against Mendel's views. And Radic and Jamieson has actually created a modern genetics course that begins with the Weldonian framework, and then only later mentions Mendel as a special case um, that can be true um, under restrictive circumstances. So I think the, these uh, attempts are wonderfully stimulating. And I think it is possible to imagine a different kind of science education while respecting Kuhn's recognition of the importance of disciplined training. So I'm gonna stop there and hopefully we'll have some time for questions. Thank you so much for listening. I'm sure everyone in the audience joins me in applauding the work. Now we move into Q&A. If you have questions, comments, rejoinders, please don't hesitate. Let me perhaps break the ice with a question of my own. Um, and Theo had a hand. Oh, I see, I apologize. So first, um, let's come back to my question, but let's first go to Theo and then to Hane. Theo, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Hasok. That, that was really interesting, as, as usual. <laughs> um, um, I, I want to ask you something about um, um, a point that you made that Kuhn hasn't, I mean, has argued in favor of dogmatic trade training, but hasn't really demonstrated the, the advantages, the comparative advantages of uh, dogmatic training you know, compared to other forms of more pluralistic training. But in one of the slides that you showed us, I mean, that's exactly the point that he made, that um, when you move from a more pluralist kind of training to a more dogmatic kind of training, characterizing normal science, then that's when, you know, rapid progress becomes. So I'm not sure that, I mean, I'm not saying that he's right or, or wrong, but I think he, he, he argued, he made mm -hmm. a comparative argument in defense of his, um, you know, uh, uh, his dogmatic uh, training approach. It's yeah, a yeah. minor point, but perhaps- No, no, it's a very important point. And I think the point is that he made a historical argument. And he said, you, you look at the origins of science and it is, right, the quote that I didn't have time to read out. It is precisely when dogmatic training begins that we seem to have started making rapid progress in science, even in terms of innovative ideas. So I think he, he did have a good argument, but what I would question is whether that argument can be extrapolated safely into the present and the future. So I, I think the situation of science back at the starting of these specialized fields was quite different from uh, what we have now. For one thing, right, two, two points. One is that, as I mentioned in the first argument for pluralist education, we now have the benefit of history in which all these various different ways of doing science became established by the kind of Kuhnian normal science, right? So it's different from the pre-Socratics, say, right, who had lots of ideas, none of which had been established through 
the process of successful normal science, right? So now we have more to draw from when we are trying to be realistically pluralistic. And the other thing is, um, I mean, the, the scientific research, not so much education, has now much more resource, right? So, you know, okay, if there were seven Copernicans in all of Europe, it made sense for them to band together and not be distracted by other ideas. Now we have thousands upon thousands of scientists really all trying to approach some topic in the same way and hitting the point of diminishing returns. So I think now the scientific community as a whole can really afford to nurture multiple traditions. And I think that is beginning to happen. So yes, to be fair to Kuhn, he certainly gave an empirical argument, but it's the projecting into the future that I would question. May, may I follow up? I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's time and I don't want to monopolize, but I think he, he also compares science with other fields mm -hmm. where there is, there is a critical tradition. He compares science with philosophy. And uh, he argued that exactly because in, in, other, in other fields, again, uh, training is, is more critical, that, that's why you know, they don't progress as much as science. I think that mm -hmm. that was part of his argument. It wasn't just a you know, historical argument, but mm -hmm. also a comparison. It was based also on a comparison of science with, uh, or, or, yeah, of science yeah, yeah. with other fields. Sure, yeah. And my proposal only works if we preserve that element of rigorous training. So it, it's not the denial of normal training, but the argument is that we can have multiple ones and even a given scientist can hold that together. So that's the point to be mm -hmm. uh, examined, I think, in my proposal. Is that really possible as a matter of psychology and as a matter of resources? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much to both. The next question comes from Hanna. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for your talk, Hasak. And, and I'm really happy or is that we bring more focus on, on science education into our debates in, in philosophy of science. I can soothe you that our uh, Kuhn's view on science education hasn't been quite as absent from philosophy of science as, as you may have thought. Or this book on Kuhn, which I like to show that I authored myself, has several sections on, on science education. So it's out there. Um, and, and also, I followed up with our a publication in science education crossover stuff, our, our explaining Kuhn's view to the science education community. And, and, I, and I have to say that that was met with quite some skepticism. Our Kuhn's conservative view was provocative back in 59 when he presented it. And he, it has definitely remained. Are provocative in in our the community of science education. I'm I'm wondering if it might be beneficial for our debates about Kuhn's view in science education to draw in more of the our history that has passed since our Kuhn's work on the essential tension in in fifty nine, and what I'm thinking of are, are two different sources. One within science education, the way debates about science education and the nature of science has shifted, and especially the debate that you find in science education about what is called vision one, science education before around the 1970s, very much focused on those students who will move on and become scientists. And what is often referred to as vision two, science education, is it developed after the 1970s with much more focus on science education for the general population. And, and how your idea about the uh, baby training to avoid mm -hmm. the second undergraduates are, how that compares to the vision one pre-1970 or science education. So that was one historical source. Another historical source is that of course, also in philosophy of science, a lot has happened since Kuhn wrote his analysis of mm. 
And I mean, all the work by people like Nancy Session and others and model-based reasoning, mm -hmm. all those resources that can also be brought into science education to make more clear to science students, how is it this process of refining tools and changing tools or mm -hmm. can be made, which is sort of absent from in, in Kuhn's work that remains somewhat mysteriously, but we've done had a lot of work in philosophy of science over the decades yeah. that, that goes exactly into that. So, so what are your thoughts on that? Right, thank you. Um, first of all, I'm deeply ashamed I didn't know your book. <laughs> so I will go and find it. <laughs> um, and the vision one education, I, I am also not that familiar with, so I will ask you later for a reference to that. Uh, your last point, I think, is absolutely correct that, yes, we, we need to bring in sort of new ideas in philosophy of science to the discussion of education. And I mean, you are one of the few philosophers of science out there really engaging with people in education, right? This is a very sad fact. Um, and we can count you maybe on two hands. Uh, so I think that needs to be done. And looking back from that perspective, I think we can see just how traditional Kuhn's philosophical views were about the nature of scientific activity while he really emphasized the problem solving aspect, which was good. But in terms of he, his view of theory, it, in a way, it's shocking how traditional his view of theory and theorizing was. So definitely all the thinking about model-based reasoning would be very important to bring in, I think, among other things. Thank you. Thanks so much to both. And just a very quick follow-up. Um, so uh, I fully agree with you that time is ripe for pluralism. And um, I, I think that's, that's well taken. But I was wondering about uh, one way of reading uh, that short quote from uh, the 1959 paper um, that might be um, friendly to, to contemporary eyes. So for instance, uh, suppose that what uh, Kuhn might have meant then was something like this, that if you, um, um, uh, harness somebody uh, with the uh, traditional dogmas in a way that's so overbearing, at some point they'll revolt. At some point mm -hmm. they'll wish to be creatives uh, seeking alternatives to that and not necessarily because they run into a stumbling block, but because it's in the nature of such a rigid education to uh, uh, elicit a uh, kind of creative response of uh, breaking away or something like that. Hmm. So I'm not sure. What, what do you think? Clearly, that can't go for everybody, but perhaps it works for some folks. I think that, yeah, that sort of thing does happen, right? Also in social political life, right? The, the extremely oppressive regimes do produce some highly creative, rebellious individuals. Um, but I don't think that should be our way of creating creativity, right? although it does happen in some cases. And if you look at what happens in science, I, I, I think, right, of course, I haven't done empirical research on this in a systematic way, but I think most people who have that sort of response just leave science and become creative in other fields. So that doesn't help science to rely on right, that method of generating a creative response. So I think we need to figure out, right, in general, better ways of retaining scientists who are not really just following the normal training. And I mean, Kuhn himself made some suggestive remarks about that, one of which, which I always think about is how people who switch fields can become very usefully creative, right? The Francis Cricks of the world. Uh, and I wish he would have said more about that. I, I'm not sure, maybe he did and I just don't know. Um, but 
there would be other considerations one can make about how we can accommodate people who don't respond in a normal way to normal training. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. And if there are further questions, rejoin those comments. If not, please join me once again in thanking Professor Chuck. Thank you.